Um, for the invitation to, to speak. I mean, I was particularly interested in the relationship between climate change, migration, and race and racialized narratives, and, because my background is mainly on colonial and post colonial interventions, particularly around the forced movement of, of people. So I've been looking at political exiles during the colonial period who were sent to small island states and looking at Chinese labour migrants who work in the garment sector in the, in the Indian Ocean. So I don't really come from a climate change background. And I think what's really interesting about the study of climate change is that there are groups of people who come from that environmental climate change background and there's other people who don't but bring something to bear on it. And I think that's why this workshop in, the, in a way is incredibly important because it's getting us to start linking some of those ideas together. Um, so, you know, I, I have to say I'm not a climate change uh, expert or specialist at all. Um, but I've been carrying out research in small island states, particularly in the Indian Ocean, over the last 22, 23 years, looking at different global processes, looking at the political economy of small island states. And when I say to colleagues or, or friends that, you know, I'm doing research on globalization, its impact, material effects on the periphery of the global economy, uh, that I'm looking at labor migration, they, they appear to be really interested and they ask me questions. And when they say where, and I say the Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles, they say, oh yeah, sure, that's a holiday. Yes. And so kind of persistent and pervasive is that response. In fact, everybody says that. When I say, I'm going to the Maldives on Monday, they say, lucky you. They don't say that, or they didn't say that when I was working in Bangladesh. And so I thought, well, there's something about an imaginary around these places, a Western colonial imaginary, a geographic imaginary around these places, and trying to understand where does that come from. Because nobody asks me about the politics of the Seychelles. No one says anything about the ethnic tension in Mauritius, the coups in the Seychelles. Nobody asks those kinds of questions about the politics, the economics, the, the, the racial um, dimensions of those societies. It's always, oh, lucky you, you're going to this place where there is a particular kind of imaginary. So what I want to do is to explore the construction of that colonial geographic imaginary and how it pervades um, contemporary discourses and racialized narratives um, in the environmental discourse and particularly on climate change and displacement. So I'm focusing particularly on small island states, but I have to say these representations, which are purely discursive, they have material effects, um, are not unique to islands. So how, how islands are conceived, for example, relies on discursive representations that conjure up particular images of these places. So they're seen as idyllic, uh, remote, which we heard yesterday in one of the presentations, isolated, often virgin territories. They also conjure up certain kinds of images and representations about the population that these islands are uninhabited or sparsely populated, um, that they have no settled or indigenous population, or that their populations are uncivilized, backward, childlike, etc. And we're very familiar with those kinds of colonial imaginaries. And what I'm suggesting is, what I want to suggest, is that there is a colonial legacy to contemporary representations of islands, and that those in turn justify particular kinds of interventions. So we know colonialists couldn't intervene in the ways in which they did in former colonies unless they constructed the population in particular ways and had constructed those people in particular ways. And that's what Zaid uh, wrote about so extensively and eloquently. Um, so those representations then together of people and places and populations legitimized particular colonial attitudes and also policies of, for example, forcibly moving populations. So I want to look at the colonial construction of those islands and then to look at how those legacies are being appropriated, reworked and recast in the contemporary moment, in the present, in post-colonial con context. And I'm not saying they're unproblematically mapped onto the contemporary moment, but they're invoked and they're adapted in particular ways. And they inform then the knowledge that we have around climate change. They in inform in some way the way in which we think about an environmental refugee. But I don't want to be historically deterministic either, and what I want to do in, in the paper um, is also challenge, in a way, how we can contest those kinds of imaginaries. How can that climate change discourse, those affected by environmental change in vul vulnerable states, can create new and different forms of representation to contest and replace those tenacious, colonialist, racialized 
um, narratives and highlight some of the ways in which that's done. Okay. So I'm going to look at colonial representations of island states, then look at the history of racialized discourses of displacement and movement, look at how that's transferred into a post-colonial context, how climate change discourse is also invoked to justify post-colonial interventions, colonialist interventions, um, and then look at some of the attempts to unsettle those tenacious um, racialized narratives and representations. But I think it's really important just to remember or to remind ourselves of two things. And the first is, and this is from, from Andrew's paper yesterday, is that climate change um, discourse is not necessarily just mapped onto or practice, climate change practice and intervention and policy as well, isn't just mapped onto a racialized social order. But that that racialized social order actually constitutes the way in which we construct that discourse. So it's not just that there is this discourse out there and it's mapped onto a context or an environment which is racialized, but that very social order also constitutes the way in which we think about climate change and the environment. But despite some of the attempts then to reveal the tenacious strands of racialized forms of knowing and representing other people in other places, there's a resounding silence, it seems to me, around race in environmental discourses. And that's why I think this workshop is incredibly important, but it's also showing us how difficult it is to do that, how difficult it is to bring some of those different components, some of those different um, ideologies uh, together. And I think this workshop is a really important step in getting us to think about that and to reveal the racist narratives within environmental discourses and the racialized forms of power and inequality and knowledge that underpin that discourse and the way in which it gets articulated. So while the meanings of race are socially constructed and, phys and politically contested, race does continue to be known through different types of bodies. And this is um, a Christmas card uh, that was sent by French colonialists back home. So actually written on the body of the colonized. And, it, and in a way, with the way in which I sort of talk about race as a discursive category with real material effects of difference and inequality is socially con constituted and isn't rooted in biological distinctions, but the body is important and the body of the refugee is important. And I think we need to embody, in a sense, some of those kinds of representations. So, what I do is draw on Edward Said's notion of a geographic imaginary, which refers literally to how spaces are imagined. It doesn't mean that they're, they're not real, but they're representational, discursive um, impact and meanings that are ascribed to physical places. Um, and how knowledge then about those places is produced. And importantly, that, that the ways in which that knowledge justifies and legitimizes certain kinds of interventions. So you couldn't colonize if you didn't construct the other as being inferior in some way or backward in some way. So a discourse enables particular kinds of interventions to take place. And Edward Said reminds us that we wouldn't have had an empire itself without these important philosophical and imaginative process processes at work. And I think it's through those processes that the colonies were socially spatialized as sites of adventure, um, exploration, power, control, um, and also philanthropy. So colonizers successively and simultaneously appropriated, disciplined, classified, negated, idealized, eroticized, colonized spaces. And there's been a lot written about that. Indeed, places to be colonized could be represented as empty of cultural or economic value, but full of potential that they couldn't meet themselves, but they needed the colonizers to go and to enable those places to become productive, domesticated, and civilized through this process of colonialism. Now, importantly, uncivilized was typically synonymous with insignificant and invisible. So consequently, these places were con often conceived as open virgin territory. So even though there were people there, they very often weren't recognized because they weren't modern they weren't seen to be, um, they were seen to be traditional, they were seen to be backward. So often conceived as landscapes without people or inhabited by those with no ability to organize the, themselves through self-government, for example. And these essentialist representations <coughs> accentuated the distance between colonizer and colonized, but it also fueled colonial ambitions 
and provided authoritative legitimacy to colonial interventions. And this is, I've just finished a project on the Empire Marketing Board posters, which was an attempt, it was kind of an early um, attempt to, like the fair trade campaign in, in many ways in, in the present, but it was an early attempt to get British consumers to buy empire produce in order to keep the empire going. And this was a, dwind there was a dwindling empire, it was in the late 1920s. And for seven years, they produced over 800 posters, which were on huge billboards in every crossroads in Britain. You couldn't be living in Britain at the time and not know about the Empire Marketing Board. And they invited famous artists to produce um, some of these posters. And as time went on, the, the posters weren't just about, you know, let the ingredients of your Christmas pudding, there's a great poem in one of them about the ingredients of your Christmas pudding. You get nutmeg from here, vanilla from... The, the, from Mauritius and you get you know, cinnamon from somewhere else and the, all the ingredients were from the empire. But they started to move into talking about issues of development more broadly. And it seems to me that the development industry today in, indeed has its legacy in some of these kinds of colonial representations. And here we have East African transport old style, the big virile muscular white man who brings East African transport new style. And so this is not only that you buy empire produce, but we can also help the colonies um, to develop. So those essentialist representations accentuated that distance then between the colonizer and the colonized and fueled, as I said, colonial ambitions. But of course, there were many different imaginaries that were being played out. So there wasn't a sing single colonial um, imaginary, but various forms of engagement, encounter, and interventions. And in the Indian Ocean, there was a very distinct repertoire of representations that were constructed and mobilized to justify colonial policies of, for example, indentured labor, exiles, so from the late 1800s until 1956, um, there were over 600 anti-colonial nationalist leaders sent from other parts of the empire to the Seychelles. Why the Seychelles? Because of this Western imaginary of the Seychelles as being isolated and remote, and they couldn't infect others with their political sentiments. And the last political exile was actually Archbishop Makarios, but there was also the Pasha of Egypt, the nationalist leaders um, from all over the empire that were sent to the Seychelles. But of course, the Seychelles wasn't empty, and it wasn't remote. It might, be, it might have been in the middle of the Indian Ocean, but actually the Seychelles or Mauritius has no indigenous population. It's very much made up of the movement of traders, um, Chinese traders, French, British colonialists, um, indentured labor, for example, slaves, exiles. Um, so in a way, that kind of representation, I think, has transcended the, the moment of colonial rule, the temporal moment of colonial rule, and continues to be deployed in different ways in the present, although in some ways it's reworked. So islands have for long featured um, in colonial imaginaries. Initially they were unknown, they were mysterious, desolate, isolated outcrops, uninhabited, empty spaces, specks on a map. And as one of the former um, uh, presidents of the Association of American Geographers um, wrote terra incognita, which are these islands on the map. These words stir the imagination. Right? Unexplored, rivers shown by broken lines, islands marked existence doubtful. That there was this colonial ambition to explore places that were supposedly unexplored. And, um, you know, uh, Kipling, Conrad, had all written about when they were, they were young boys that they would open a map and when they grow up, when they said, when I grow up, I'm going to go there and pinpoint a speck in the Indian Ocean or, or in the sea somewhere. And so islands featured as very different kinds of imaginaries. And there was a whole literary construction of small tropical islands in novels such as Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Stevenson's Treasure Island, uh, Ballantyne's Coral Island. And they helped, in a way, construct spaces in which imperial geographies were conceived and those colonial ambitions were provoked. But the native in inhabitants of these islands were conceived in highly racialized ways that justified European power over people. And it wasn't just through or confined to literary pieces. It wasn't just Robinson Crusoe, but was reinforced in colonial travel writing. And so Marion North, who travels to the Seychelles, says, nutmeg, cinnamon, and cloves were all growing luxuriously, but the natives were too lazy to pick them. 
They are on the whole as simple-minded people, as hard-working as, hard as the innate sloth their nature will allow. Or physically, they're a fine race, great muscular strength, rivaling ugliness of feature. So there are all these representations in travel writing, through explorers, through adventurers, that embedded and reinforce that kind of racialized narrative. So representations of island people were also deeply gendered, and the women of the Indian Ocean Islands were envisaged as willing participants in the male colonial sexual adventure, whereas their male counterparts, as Edwards has written, were f um, physically a fine race, but ugliness of feature. And they also legitimised the appropriation of these places for what was considered to be more effective usage. So those range of discourses and images together produced and confirmed racial superiority. And Stanley looks in Tanganyika and he looks out over this landscape and he says, what a settlement one could have in this valley. Fancy a church spire rising where that tan and raises dark crown of foliage. Think how well a score of pretty cottages would look instead of those thorn clumps and gum trees. So there we are, the landscape being reworked through a colonial imaginary, mapping a western landscape into, a, a, onto um, a colonised space. And so, in a way, saying that we can make this place better if we change this landscape to reflect and to look like the landscapes that we come from. Right? So not seeing them in and of themselves. Now, that history of racialised discourses of displacement, of, um, sorry, the, the, those, that history, that colonial history of racialised discourses um, infected their interventions and justified and legitimised colonial interventions. And a very important part of those interventions was the displacement of people and the forced movement of people. And I've already mentioned political exiles, but also um, slaves, indentured labourers. So the entire population of Diego Garcia, part of Mauritius prior to independence and the largest of six atolls of the Chagos um, archipelago, were forcibly moved between 1965 and 1971 to Seychelles, but mostly to Mauritius, to make way for the creation of a military base. So that construction, that colonial construction, that racialized narrative enabled, I want to show, that movement of people. The islands were imagined, the Chagos Islands were imagined as desolate outcrops, but ones which nevertheless appeared to provide solutions to the problems that were presented by growing inter-imperial rivalries. So, in a way, what the British did at that time was to invoke that kind of colonial imaginary, that racialized narrat um, narrative, uh, to offer, at negligible cost, British territory, the Chagos Islands, particularly Diego Garcia, to the, to the US, upon which an American base could be established, what eventually resulted in the creation of Camp Justice on Diego Garcia. Now, crucially, the way in which Diego Garcia and its population were conceived invoked a racialized imaginary and played a very important role in helping the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, as it became in 1968, to justify that forced eviction. So how did they do that? Well, at the time, you had these two opposing organizations. You had the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, but you also had the UN. And the Ilwa, the Chagossians, were characterized by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as migrant workers rather than settled people. And that was a very important distinction. As one colonial administrator put it, although many of them have been long established and long resident in the islands, their continuation in the islands has always been contingent on their being employed on the plantations. So what they're suggesting here, that rather neutral statement, Okay, that they might have been long residents on these islands, but actually they're only there to work on the plantations. That rather neutral statement belies a concerted attempt that was made to construct the population in such a way that their forced compulsion was, wasn't only made possible, but also justified. So invoking a racialized narrative in order to say these places are uninhabited. The people that you see living there are just there as migrants. They're just there as workers. They're not residents. So the Foreign um, and Commonwealth Office then forcibly um, compelled these people to move, but it was an essential element of their discourse, of their strategy, to placate a potentially hostile United Nations General Assembly, which is very different in the way in which it's constructed today. Now, the UN General Assembly was opposed to the partition of colonial territories prior to independence. 
Uh, they didn't want lots of places separating off before countries gained independence, and Diego Garcia was part of Mauritius. So the Chagos Archipelago had to be seen to possess no indigenous population. So an FCO memo in 1965 said, a small number of people were born there, and in some cases, their parents were born there too. The intention is, however, that none of them should be regarded as being permanent inhabitants. In the absence of permanent inhabitants, the obligations of Chapter 11 of the UN Charter will not apply to the territory, and we don't have to tell the Secretary General anything. So because they have no population, we don't even have to tell the UN that actually we're moving these people. And consolidating the attempt to veil the existence of a permanent population, the FCO went on to say, we want to avoid all reference to permanent inhabitants, and advise, they advised a policy of quiet disregard. So in 1966, the Foreign Office minuted that the object of the exercise to move people is to get some rocks which will remain ours. There'll be no indigenous population except seagulls who haven't got a UN committee yet. Unfortunately, along with the birds, go some few Tarzans and Men Fridays whose origins are obscure and who are hopefully wished on to Mauritius. So, I mean, for me, this is just the most amazing quote to find because, you know, I'd, I'd sort of embedded my argument in Robinson Crusoe and Daniel Defoe, and here it is, being invoked, you know, all the, that... that Robinson Crusoe was written in the 1700s, and here we are in 1966, and they're invoking the whole sort of racialized narrative in order to forcibly move the whole population of Diego Garcia and rent the island to the US government on a 50-year lease for a nominal amount. And there's since been a long-lived and ongoing legal battle to resettle the islands. Now, I'm going to return to the story of Diego Garcia, but what I want to move on to show now <coughs> is how these colonial representations and imaginaries continue to influence the framing of racialized environmental discourses, particularly around migration and displacement in the present. So how do those colonial representations travel through different temporal moments, through different political contexts, and we can see them evident in environmental discourses today? But Secondly, what I want to show is not just how contemporary discourses are shaped by colonial imaginaries, but how increasing global concerns over the environment and climate change in particular are being used to justify colonialist interventions in the present. Okay, so colonial imaginaries are evident, I want to argue, in contemporary environmental discourse around climate change and migration, but the global discourse of environment and climate change and migration is also justifying racialized colonialist interventions in the present. They are being invoked in order to implement unfavorable policies in the contemporary period. So the British colonial government, we know, sustained its power and interests in part through the forcible movement of colonized people from one part of the empire to another. So it's not new, that forcible movement of people. And I want to focus here on how the construction of knowledge about climate change and migration, and in particular the concept of the environmental refugee, articulate that colonialist and racialized notion. Okay, so I'm doing the first part, which is how colonial representations have traveled into the current construction of an environmental discourse. And I want to do it through two main arguments. One is the construction of knowledge and expertise in the environmental discourse, and the second is the invoking or the construction of the concept of an environmental refugee. So the construction and status of particular kinds of knowledge have played a significant role in the development of climate change and migration discourses. Now, clearly, there's a wide range of actors, scientists, government bodies, non-governmental agencies, activist groups, who are all involved in the ongoing production of what we understand around environmental change and climate change and migration. And in a way, together, they delimit the boundaries of what is possible for us to discuss, and in part, why it's so hard to talk about racialized narratives, that they have closed off, as Callum was talking yesterday, closed off and delimited the boundaries of the discussions that we can, um, that we can carry out. So they delimit the boundaries of the debate and produce shared meanings across different sites in different places. And I work in development, and I'm always amazed when you know, I have a student who comes from Mongolia who says, you know, I want to look at gender analytical frameworks. And I think, well, how, you know, how's there the rolling out across space of this small kind of 
number of techniques or ways of thinking around development. And environmental discourse, it seems to me, is shaped by different actors, but simultaneously produces some kind of shared meaning across different scales. Having said that, scientific knowledge does tend to dominate how we understand climate change and its impacts. So, for example, the IPCC has come to dominate representations of climate change, presenting its reports to the world as the consensus view of the leading climate change experts in the world. So environmental change is often presented in overly scientific terms, using the exclusive language of so-called experts. And climate change policies, then, are often legitimised through the professionalisation and technicalisation of knowledge. So there's a whole industry around climate change. There's an industry of so-called professionals, experts. It's become a techno-managerial discourse. But principles of authority, what Escobar calls principles of authority, then valorise certain kinds of knowledge and privilege the role of the expert who identifies problems, categorises them, labels them, and then intervenes to resolve them. And that exclusivity of knowledge is reinforced when the environment is framed by policymakers as an overly complex system. You, you won't understand, it's very complicated. It's part of the remit of what scientists do, and it's only held by so-called, or understood by experts. But whiteness and the West provide symbols of that authority, expertise and knowledge. And we know that racialized power relations are evident in the production of authoritative knowledge. Who can speak about whom and how? And how is knowledge constructed and what knowledge is considered to be significant? And the implications of the often unacknowledged and unconscious assumption of white superiority and expertise as part of a wider global distribution of racialized power, it seems to me, is little understood. But it's founded upon the types of colonial legacy that, I want, that I've identified um, previously, but also in racialized media images in contemporary coverage of environmental concerns. So here we have, I don't know if you can see, this is after Hurricane Katrina, but in the top picture, the black young lad, and it says, a young man walks through, the, through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store. The two white residents Two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery <laughs> store. So there we have this kind of media, popular representation um, of the, and, and how the discourse is racialized in terms of its Im impact. And so the, the white are residents. They're residents. They belong to the place. The black man's not a resident. He loots. He doesn't find. Right. He will always biologically become a criminal in any context around that change, whereas the white couple will always be victims of what's happened, that they are not implicated in some way, right. that they're not all victims, and that we divide them up in this racialized way. So certain bodies are thought to possess certain kinds of capabilities and claims to the land. And certain bodies are thought to possess superior levels of knowledge and experience than others. And a most obvious distinction persists between those who are thought to possess expertise and knowledge and those to whom it should be imparted. A distinction that's based not on what you know. Knowledge is not based on what you know. It's who you are and where you come from. And clearly, therefore, is a racialized discourse around knowledge production. It's based on ideas about people rather than a supposedly objective difference in knowledge or expertise. So possession of the latest terminology, the techniques, the skills, can only partially signify knowledge. What's much more often predetermined, or it's much more often predetermined by the source and social context from which it emerged emerges. And as Ngugi wrote, there is also the colonization of the mind, whereby for some formerly colonized people, whiteness becomes associated with superior knowledge, with expertise, with certain types of cultural values. And the West becomes identified or symbolized by modernity and progress. And Crew and Harrison have written a lot about this and confirm that it's not always what is known, but who knows that signifies expertise. So climate change discourse in the way in which it's dominated by, a science, by scientific knowledge or the knowledge of ex experts is necessarily, I would argue, a racialized discourse because knowledge itself is not race neutral and who possesses knowledge isn't race neutral. <laughs>
Although, um, in, a, in a way, race does play out very differently in different contexts, it is evident that experts are not only transmitters of ideas, language and techniques of climate change and displacement, but in the process are involved in reinforcing racialized power relations. So it's not just that certain people are seen to have knowledge, but through that process of ascribing to them superior cultural values or symbols or as symbols of modernity and progress, that they reinforce racialized power relations. So it's an ongoing process. Now, there have been lots of critiques um, of expertise within the climate change discourse, and they are increasing, but race is rarely mentioned. The way in which that expertise is racialized is rarely mentioned, but it is mobilized by technocratic, scientific, and expert narratives that represent one of the key arenas through which a racialized discourse is sustained. The second way, so that's through knowledge. The second is through the racialized concept of the environmental refugee. And I don't want to talk very much about this because I know that lots of people have done research on it and it was mentioned yesterday. But there's been a lot of critical work on the dangers around the particular language and politics of climate change that has addressed the discursive categorization of people. And most notably, I think, through the invoking of an environmental refugee, that concept of an environmental refugee. And while the phenomenon and estimates of environmental refugees are compelling to some in academic and policy-making arenas, the term has been criticized for its usefulness in terms of its methodology. But while it has been criticized in various ways, the extent to which it reflects a racial representation, I think, has been much overlooked. And there's a range of politically charged narratives, and I think um, that Andrew quoted Hartman yesterday, saying that it fuels Western anxieties by drawing on deep-seated fears and stereotypes of the dark-skinned, overbreeding, dangerous poor. And you know, other people have argued the way in which, for example, um, it could increase uh, conflicts in places where people move to, that there could be violent conflicts, and it affects, affects shaping our popular imagination around refugees, and we had lots of depictions yesterday um, through the various representations. So those representations and concerns persist, despite the fact that there is no trend towards large south to north migrations that have been identified. You know, there isn't even that racialized scientific knowledge that can show that there, are this mass, there is this massive movement south to north. So discourse of climate change and migration are deeply racialized. But what I want to go on to talk about now is how those discourses are being invoked in the present to justify racialized colonialist policies. So what I want to suggest is that the construction of an environmental discourse, which itself I wanted to show is racialized, allows certain groups of people to intervene in highly racialized ways, that their interventions are not based on climate change, but they're based on other kinds of political motivations and other kinds of agendas that use the science of climate change in order to justify those interventions. And I think there's limited discussion on how discourses of climate change and migration have been constructed, appropriated, and mobilized in support of particular ideologies. So while environmental arguments may appear as factual and scientific, they are also suggestive and atmospheric. But that tendency to represent nature as uncontested and apolitical has allowed climate change to be appropriated uncritically in support of an expanding range of ideologies. And I want to go back then to Diego Garcia and the Iloire. So these are um, popular representations, um, racialized popular representations um, that, you know, I mean, Kind of, well, I don't need to say very much about them. You can interpret them. Um, so back to the Ilwa. So the 50 years is up for the lease. Right? The British handed over a nominal amount, uh, Diego Garcia, to the US in order to set up Camp Justice. But the 50 years is nearly up for the lease of Diego Garcia. And while in the past the idea that they were not inhabitants but migrant laborers was invoked to enable and justify their forced exile, now, they have to look somewhere else in order to justify keeping the Ilwa off Diego Garcia, because the lease has run out and they are now campaigning to return. So in a very clever move, Diego Garcia 
was proclaimed um, or became a marine protected area in April 2011. So an environmental discourse was invoked to justify the continuing exile of the Ilois. So whereas before it was a colonial uh, legacy around sparsely populated, uninhabited, they're really migrants, they don't, they're not resident, they don't belong there, you can't use that argument anymore because they are in exile and they're visibly in exile in Mauritius and they're campaigning against their exile. So what better than to invoke a global environmental discourse and now claim that actually no one should live there, of course, apart from the US military, because it's a marine protected area. And this is them campaigning outside my association, my society, the Royal Geographic Society in London, where a meeting was set up. So it became a marine protected area in 2011. And that prevents now, for a long, long time, the possibility of return for the Ilois. The second way in which an environmental um, discourse is being invoked is in the Maldives. And in the Maldives, um, for many, many years, well, since independence, but actually even before independence, that the Maldivian government has wanted to resettle the population in outlying islands because there's 1,500 atolls, they want to control, they don't want to put a primary school where there's only a population of 50, for example, in one of the islands. They have to build a landing dock for every island. So they've always wanted to introduce um, a resettlement program where they can move the population off 200 inhabited islands onto between 10 and 12 what they call hub islands. Now, they've never been able to do that. The population's about 350,000. Um, you know, many of them living below the poverty line, unemployment's at 20%. The economy is very heavily dependent on tourism. And in Mali, the capital, there's a third of the population in two square kilometers. So it's one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Now, so what they want to do is resettle the population into these hubs. But they've never been able to do it because there's been so much popular resistance. Right? And as time went on and as the dictatorship was, was sort of waning, being pushed to have multi-party elections, that they, the government always sort of backtracked and said, well, we won't do it now because there was so much unpopular protest. And in his first public address following the election to government in 2008, he held an underwater cabinet meeting, and I'm sure many of you have seen this fantastic image. Um, and he announced the establishment of a sovereign wealth fund to buy a new homeland for Maldivians as an insurance policy in the event of wholesale displacement and relocation. So he wrote to the government in Sri Lanka, India and Australia to say, do you have a space, a little plot of land that we could have for 350,000 people? So it was this huge PR stunt. This was a PR stunt, this huge kind of declaration, we are losing our homeland and we're gonna have to move somewhere else. Now, of course, that raises huge questions around sovereignty. And in a very kind of bizarre, slight bizarre, um, well, he drew on a somewhat bizarre analogy when he said, we can do nothing to stop climate change on our own, and so we have to buy land elsewhere. After all, he says, the Israelis began by buying land in Palestine. Now, you know, that's a very interesting way in which he kind of completely misreads the global politics around kind of settlement, resettlement, etc. Now, through these pronouncements of a mass exodus, the president wanted to demonstrate that the small island state was a victim of climate change caused by rich countries. So he's speaking outwardly. He's not speaking to the people who voted him, who just voted him. He's speaking to the world. And he, he wants to shame the industrial countries into action, to threaten if the Maldives, he writes, is not saved today, we do not feel that there's much chance for the rest of the world. So it's a political weapon to demonstrate to the world that the president is taking climate change seriously. Politically motivated, his proposals backfired when Maldivians expressed serious concerns. They were saying, well, I don't want to go and live in Australia. I don't want to live in Sri Lanka. Because he was speaking to the outside world and had completely misunderstood the way in which the Maldivians understood their, their residency, their home on individual atolls. So he also talked about resettlement and population consolidation, which was this policy that they had tried to introduce for over 30 years, but had been very unpopular. But what happens now is that he invokes the climate change discourse to say you have to resettle 
And his policy of resettlement and population consolidation gains renewed leverage through invoking that climate change and environment discourse and a discourse of displacement. And the Foresight Report reaffirms what he's trying to do. The Foresight Report says there are these hotspots and you've got to move people. And he says, you know, forget about the population consolidation programs of the former government. Right? We know that they were just trying to trick you. They were trying to reduce the burden on, um, the, on the, the tax. They were trying to reduce the burden of providing a school and a health clinic and a docking, a boat docking uh, place on each of the islands. They were doing it for economic and political reasons, but I am motivated by concerns for your welfare because sea level is rising. And invoking that environmental discourse to justify um, unfavorable favorable policy. So today, the same initiative that had been introduced over 30 years that was intensely unpopular is gaining renewed leverage by being couched in environmental terms. And those people who've said that they will move say, but we don't want to move into the hubs, we want to move on to Mali, which is already the most densely populated place. So, you know, there's the problem there about where you move people to. So environmental discourses are being mobilised to reintroduce previously unpopular resettlement and migration policies. And as such, environmental discourse, and particularly responses to environmental crises, can be seen as yet another attempt to discipline society through the exercise of power. So understandings of the processes of scientific knowledge production and use reveal the enormous political and discursive power of racialized environmental narratives. But I don't want to say that people are um, just kind of victims of these colonial racialized narratives. And what's happening while that colonizing legacy pervades present day representations, polities and economies, such depictions are not immutable that they're being recast through various forms of situated agency. So, you know, we know that global space is ceaselessly reimagined and rewritten by centres of power and authority, but also there are opportunities to reclaim those representations, adapt them, reconfigure them in the present. And as Stuart Hall writes, no project achieves a position of permanent hegemony and excluded social forces whose consent has not been won, whose interests have not been taken into account, form the basis of counter-movements, resistance, alternative strategies and visions. And I think Arun mentioned Dave Featherston's work yesterday who's, who highlights some of those kind of forms of resistance. So there's a reclaiming then of a colonial imaginary through tourism. So they're using the colonial imaginary as a cultural and economic resource um, for Mauritius, for example, in this case. So the island imaginary has become an important resource that small island states can adapt and utilize in their current development strategies, most particularly in the development of a tourist product actively marketed as idyllic, deserted, and isolated. Right, so invest in paradise and this paradise island. Um, and that contemporary example, I think, is reflected in the development of the success of the tourist sectors in Seychelles, Mauritius, and Maldives. So those kinds of representations or the kinds of responses that I received when I say that I do research in Mauritius, Maldives, and Seychelles is exactly the kind of colonial imaginary that is now being reworked by Mauritius, Maldives, and Seychelles to sell back to the West their islands to meet their colonial imaginary in order to play into that colonial imaginary. Because palm trees are not indigenous to Mauritius, they are brought in to meet our imaginary of those places. So they're planted. Sand is moved or imported in order to reproduce the lagoon, because the corals, as we know, are starting to well, die off in some places. So the sand is brought in so that that image, that idyllic image of wading out in clear blue water for half a mile before, you know, you're kind of up to here in water, is actually produced by moving sand. The image of the palm trees, is that they're imported and planted in those areas. So they're being reworked, they're reworking and adapting a colonial imaginary to sell back to the West its own colonial imaginary that all the while was an imaginary with real material effects. And travel writings of the post-independence period, as well as tourist brochures, um, continue, you know, provide ample evidence of that colonial discourse. Colonialist claims that Seychelles was the site of the Garden of Eden, 
features strongly in the tourist industry in Seychelles today and is disseminated by tour companies and the media more generally. And the British Daily Telegraph, for example, in 2003 commented, the general impression was one of a Garden of Eden, referring to Seychelles, in which only the apple tree and the serpent were missing. So it's, you purify, you're pu they're purifying space through a racialized imaginary. And you have to see it as empty because you have to be the only person on that deserted island. You have to relive, as with the Ministry of Tourism in the Maldives writes, you must come to Maldives to visit any one of a thousand Robinson Crusoe islands. So trying to get back this sort of image of how you can live your life, how you can be the explorer, you are the only one on this island. And in Mauritius, an attempt has been made to recreate an apparently idyllic and luxurious period in the country's history. And one of the research projects that I've just completed is on this particular resort, which is called Sugar Beach Resort. Now, there's so many hotels, this is in Mauritius, so many hotels in Mauritius that each of them needs to adopt a theme in order to mark themselves out to um, people who want a holiday in Mauritius. And this particular resort themed itself as a colonial plantation. But a purified colonial plantation because there are no slave quarters at the Sugar Beach Resort. So it's a, a kind of arbitrary authenticity. You know, it's shaping authenticity. So people who come to Sugar Beach, which is designed in a colonial plantation style, and interestingly, each block of rooms is named after a sugar plantation that exists to this day, right? Those sugar plantations were colonial sugar plantations um, with the French and the British, but they exist to this day. And they're invited or encouraged to perform a romanticized and nostalgic reenactment of the colonial period. So when they arrive on the first day, there is a, a, a kind of um, colonial performance, a play that takes place at the cocktails on the first day. And they're invited to be colonialists, to bring back their colonial uh, uh, past. But of course, as I say, that imaginary is a much more relaxed and flexible approach to authenticity, so that colonial Mauritius can be presented as a period of grace and leisure, rather than one of severe exploitation and brutality. Now, while these island states have exercised a measure of agency by appropriating recycling representations of themselves, these attempts are reactive. I'm, not, I'm suggesting that they're not acts of resistance. They, they are reworking them. There is some kind of agency involved. But they're reactive in the sense that they occupy the same conceptual space as a colonial discourse. They haven't moved out of that discourse. They're using it in a very functional way for economic reasons, but they haven't moved out of it. And people traveling as tourists to these islands, as Harry Kunzru writes, traveling as tourists arrive and leave without knowing where they really are. And that's the point. The point is you go to Mauritius because it's only you there. And all the resorts are set up where you don't see anybody else. It is you on one of a thousand Robinson Crusoe Islands. At the same time, however, particularly in the Maldives, but also in Seychelles and Mauritius, there's an attempt to implicate former colonial environment, pol environmental policies and the impact of overconsumption by rich countries. So there are, there is a discourse of some kind of fighting back and saying that you know, it's the industrial countries that are consuming so much that has resulted in the effects of climate change in our places. There are also places where people are resisting representations in climate change narratives that tend to symbolize them purely as victims. Um, so I think one of the ways in which uh, we can discursively, in a way, resist some of these representations is um, some work that I've been doing around temporality and time. And the way in which the so-called third world is very often presented as being so over there and back then. And, you know, Paul Theroux in travel writings, he says, you know, he visited Nairobi and he says, um, Nairobi in today is like London was in Dickinson's time. So the third world is not just over there, but it's back then. It exists in the West's past. And the West is in the here and now. But environmental discourse is really disrupting that kind of representation because now the third world is the West's future. It's presenting environmental discourse and climate changes. This is your future. If you don't 
start shaping up in terms of your consumption patterns, which is what Nasheed was trying to do in the Maldives in some ways, then this is what your future will look like. And so that whole temporality, that way in which we think about time and different places is changing to a certain extent. So there's different racialized political interests that clearly play a role in how environmental narratives are produced, circulated, and interpreted. And racialized colonial and specifically island imaginaries have had a long lasting effect, most notably in the forced relocation of people and populations. And it seems to me the key now, or the key challenge, is for us to find opportunities to create other kinds of representations that can contest and replace these tenacious colonialist depictions. Thank you.